Welcome back, pet parents. I am so excited for today's guest because, first of all, I am totally into woo-woo. But even if you're not, let me just give you some perspective here. The thing that I like to tell people more than anything is that we kind of, in our society, we ha we feel like science is here and woo-woo is here and they are completely separate. And that is not the case, in my mind, at least. We're going to talk about that today. But that is not the case in my mind. Even Albert Einstein said, everything is energy. And that is, ever since I realized that and I took that in and I like internalized that, I'm good. Like, I feel so much calmer and confident walking through life because I don't feel this huge break and this huge separation. And so I like to get into more woo-woo topics sometimes. And if you remember back probably a couple months ago with Dr. Katie Woodley, we went, we, we started going down the deep end of woo-woo. And sh after we recorded, she said, you know what? You really need to get so-and-so on the podcast. Well, I have so-and-so on the podcast today. I'm super excited to introduce her to you guys. So if you are new here, my name is Jessica. I am a certified canine nutritionist and holistic pet health coach. And on the Pet Parenting Reset podcast, we talk about all, all the things, proactive health for your pets. And that includes spiritual health. That's something that so many of us overlook. But when we have a holistic approach to caring for our pets, it's a whole body approach, which does include their spirit, their soul, and their emotions. So Today's guest is Karen Dindy Smith. She is a soul level animal communicator and intuitive coach, as well as so many other things, an end of life doula, which is absolutely incredible. I don't know where you were all my life, by the way, with that one, Karen. <laughs> Um, and she's also the director and founder of the Animal Communication Collective, which is a program that I'm going to let her explain to you guys because she does so much for animals and people that also in the animal community. So thank you so much for joining us today, Karen. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me, Jessica. I'm so excited to be here. And hi, everybody. Yay. Yes. Yay. So, okay. Tell me a little bit about you and what it is that you do. Okay, so you did a great job of outlining. Thank you very much. Um, so as a soul level animal communicator, I'm actually have learned and connect with animals, well, as you would think at the spiritual soul level, and also at the 3D level. Um, and I also connect with animals who are in spirit because a soul is a soul. Sometimes it's inside a body, sometimes it's outside of a body, but it's still a soul. So with the animals, I love connecting with them sharing things from their perspective, which is what we're going to talk about today, um, and helping their humans understand the amazing capacity they have to be our partners. So that's, that's what I do in a private practice there. As a soul level intuitive coach, I'm working directly with the human on their purpose and journey on the planet, what they may be struggling with, and the, and the things maybe that the animal has brought up for them already that they're noticing. And then the person really says, well, how do I deal with this? What do I do next? So that's when I call in um, a higher consciousness. I'll just call it a higher consciousness, spirit guides, um, wisdom that has not embodied in the 3D, but is really connected. We each have our own connection to it, them, whatever you want to think of it as. And I work with and deliver information and look at a soul's journey with someone from that perspective and kind of coach them through looking at things differently so they can evolve and grow and, and really heal some things that have happened from when they were children. We all have that, right? We all, we all have that card stacked against us. So that's a big deal. Um, the animal doula, the end of life companion animal doula is something that I added to my toolkit just a couple of years ago through UVM, um, realizing that because animals were talking to me about um, what was happening for them as they were getting ready to leave their bodies, which they actually never used the word dying, which was kind of surprising to me, for me anyway. They used the words freeing, leaving, um, journeying, 
um, body hopping <laughs> in and out. There is a lot of things that they, words that they use. So um, I realized that this would be helpful for people if I really went through a, a little bit of a training on just kind of what happens for the human because the animals were telling me what happened them, for them. Um, and then the last thing that really rounds out my background is I have a background in Chinese energy medicine, um, specifically through a meditation Qigong practice called Panggu Shen Gong. I've been doing that for 20 plus years. And that's really how I started because I was doing that and it opened back up my intuition from when I was a child. And I actually started hearing from people who had passed. So mediumship came back first. And then when I was working with people, animals started showing up into their healing sessions, asking for help. And then it, it kind of segued into the animal communication. So that's my personal background. I, when you were talking about the words that they use to leave their body, I'm tearing up just thinking about it again. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that because I, I can imagine that there's at least one other person listening to this who may also be tearing up and they're like, yeah. why? Right. I don't know why, but I want to acknowledge that because it is, it's, it's okay for us to feel these feelings. And I'm saying that to me more than anything, because mm -hmm. I try yeah. so hard to be so very stoic and, um, I suppress a lot of feelings, which is not good for us. I'm, let me reiterate, that is not good for us. I know it is not good. <laughs> That's true. Um, but I do. And so um, acknowledging the feelings that we have and letting them come up, I think is important. So um, I know I have had many pets pass, pass over. And I, it just, it struck me when you said that, that like, mm -hmm. we do use the word dying. I mean, that somebody yeah. is dying somebody has died and there's so much finality in that word um which does equate to the society that we live in today right We're, that's very much totally. how we, we think as a society yeah. but spiritually it's not really accurate um we are all energy and you cannot you can't kill energy. It just transforms and transmutes. And um, we don't know what is on the, I don't know what is on the other side. Maybe you do. <laughs> I mean, I know what I've seen, but that doesn't mean I really know. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And, and it doesn't necessarily even mean that there is one singular thing right. either, but um, I just wanted to acknowledge that yeah. those feelings were coming up when you were describing their transitions, um, mm -hmm. which is a much better word for it, I think. Well, I think it should be the word that makes sense to you. And I know we're, mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about something else in just a second, yeah. but this is just so important because um, in a way, I mean, when our bodies shut down and it stops working, the body itself is going into a shutdown mode, right? And so shutdown mode is a, a, a type of death. But the, the thing is, the body may be finite, but the soul is infinite. And so the animals really are focusing on their infiniteness and their, their continued journey, which is why they don't necessarily use the word dying. They might say, mm -hmm. my systems are shutting down. My body's not working for me anymore. I need to let it go. Help me separate from. But they usually don't use the word dying just because from their perspective, they know they're not literally dying. Mm -hmm. It's really fascinating. It is. And you were also talking about um, a soul being in a body and, and sometimes not in a body. Yeah. And um, I wanted to acknowledge my thoughts on that, too, because uh, I did have the opportunity to have you connect with two of my cats recently, and I won't go into all of it. But with one of my cats in particular, it really struck me so hard. Like, I mean, I, I felt like, I felt like I could almost see it when you were describing that his soul is too big for his body. Like it's, it's this little cat body with like mm -hmm. this soul connected to it, but almost outside of it because it is just too big. And that has like, it's like, I can see that now. 
yeah, when I it's... didn't, I, there was, I had no frame of reference for that prior to talking to you. And now that is what I see when I see him. Oh. Yeah, he is. He's quite a big soul. <laughs> A very powerful being um, and in and of himself working within the confines of being with you through a cat body for him is actually kind of fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I yeah. bet. And I think, you know, he he is so strong and so strong and so powerful. And like, I can't, I almost can't believe that I didn't kind of have that acknowledgement prior to talking to you but um he definitely is is he has a has a big presence he's mm -hmm. very very strong and so he had a lot of um wisdom that was so deep like deeper than i would have ever imagined from a cat <laughs> Right. Which is so silly for me to say, um, looking back, but I guess we do kind of like put, sometimes put our pets in these like little boxes right. because they're, they're not human. And so, you know, we're always taught, especially me, like I have a background as a dog trainer. So we do have a lot of teaching with, um, you know, not anthropomorphizing our animals, but they're still souls and they're still beings yeah. that are, can be so much bigger than what we give them credit for. Right. So, yeah, I don't like, I don't know why I just felt like saying that. No, That's it's a really about. great thing to think about. It will, it, this is perfect because it will segue into what's next. Okay. But um, it's really important. I feel I've learned over the years of doing this that it, it's really important to understand that our animals are sentient beings. Mm -hmm. Having a completely full experience in their context in this world, just as we are. So if you could imagine like living in this world through their eyes and what they must see and think and feel when they have to deal with us. Yeah. Right. It goes both ways. Yeah. Um, and so they're trying the best that they can to try to understand us, to get along with us as much as we're trying to understand them and get along with them to truly sentient beings, no, no matter what kind of house you live in, trying to understand each other. Yeah. And, and the, when we come to a relationship with that, like that with our animals, then we see them as peers, different, but peers, the way that they see us as peers, because they do see us as peers, as family. So when we see them that way, it makes so much more sense why they might behave a certain way or do a certain thing or affect us in a certain way, as opposed to us saying, oh, you're not behaving, you're not living mm -hmm. up to my expe expectations of what you should be, air quote, as opposed mm -hmm. to, wow, okay, I really want to understand who you are. Yeah. Which is what and we did with your sweet babies. Yeah. Yeah. We did. Yes, you did. Absolutely. Um, and I do, that is, you're right, a very good segue into what we want to talk about today. But I thought of one other thing while you were talking, because this is what happens. Um, right. Apparently, I'm a little ADD. So, <laughs> um, I am curious as to what you think about this, because I saw something the other day that said that um, one of the big differences in dogs and cats is that dogs recognize us as other. So they know we're not dogs. They know we're something other than dogs. Mm -hmm. But cats see us as cats or as them. They see us as them. We're not others to them. They just think we're kind of incompetent and not <laughs> able to do with what they do. I don't do. know who told you that. I don't know where you learned, heard that. Um, that's really fascinating. I'm curious as to, from your perspective, because mm. I think that's kind of a... Um, that was kind of like a more scientific perspective right. on interactions between right. humans and, and pets in the home. But um, I'm curious as to your perspective on that. Oh, it's really interesting. I've never asked, that's never come up in all the communications I've had with, and I've spoken to a lot of cats. People yeah. with cats always find me. Yeah. Um, obviously I have, two, I have two cats, so. <laughs> um, 
I think the, what I pick up and I'm asking, I'm asking Dia right now, cause she's sitting right here. Like, how do you see me? You yeah. know, because that's a really good question. And they just see a, 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 from what I get from her is I just, you're my sister. You're my, mm. you're my partner. You're my, you know, you're my, so I love you. There's kind of like, oh, you're a weird human and you're not like me. It's not that it's, yeah. it's, they just, they have an affinity. She has an affinity toward me or, you know, my cats have affinities toward us and they just engage with us the way that they engage with each other. So mm -hmm. if that's what science is saying, then that would make sense. Yeah. Well, and I think I don't know specifics of this, but, um, and nothing against our dogs, right? I love, love, love our dogs. Um, but if we look back at the history of cats, the, that cats are like the, they are our protectors. They're our spiritual protectors. They mm -hmm. are, um, like guardians of the underworld and that like, so like, mm -hmm. I, I can see how it is a much more spiritual connection yes. with a cat versus with a dog. Though we've got Anubis, but still, like, you know, I, I just generally, we see cats as much more mystical creatures. And so having that, have it makes sense to me that to them, we're all souls, we're all spirit, we're all like, mm -hmm. and so that's how they interact. With them. <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, just to blow everyone's minds a little more, right? There is this part of this construct that we just... It's above our pay grade, as I say, for us to really understand why the construct is the construct. And so the, even the idea that there is put on this planet a cat species, yeah. a dog species, a human species, a lizard species, that the, a tree species, um, and how, they, how we all operate with around each other and to learn from each other, that's that's part of the larger experiment that we don't, we don't privy to. We might get inklings about, but yeah. truly that higher intelligence and even the intelligence of the, the cat construct has something built into it that supports the cat construct, which is, yeah, and baked into that diva, right? The diva or the, the spiritual connection of all cats. I mean, obviously there are cats that behave more like dogs and, and some that are yeah. different than others, but um, that whole idea of each of these constructs and these layers or these being diva, diva um, layers is to operate and teach and experience a certain thing. And so we think of the energy of cat and its spiritualness and its lightness and, and it's and the idea that it, it cats are more connected to a spirit world easier they when they fall asleep and they meditate they leave their bodies more than dogs do um they see aura they they feel spirit in a different way than a dog does and they're pushing us to kind of lighten that part of us up right does that mean dogs aren't doing that too no of course they are but the essence of the dog diva the dog layer is truly about true loyalty right? And really being there for each other and really engaging and bringing our hearts in and grounding us. And that's their kind of construct layer. But that doesn't mean they also don't see spirit and, and leave their bodies and all of that. It, I've met plenty of dogs that do that, but there's just an essence that they each have for a reason. Yeah. Which is kind of well, cool. It is. And they're all, they all enter our lives, I think, for different for various reasons and mm -hmm. you know, different people have different reasons as well. But so when Dr. Katie Woodley and I were speaking, we were talking about, of course, we we're talking about holistic health, right? That's what she does. Um, but a part of that is how we affect our pets. And mm. um, interestingly, I was just talking, so the, the, podcast I recorded yesterday was with Dr. Marlene Siegel. So it will have aired by now. And we started talking about this too, because I have had so many clients that I'm like, I'm sorry. I, I know I'm a very blunt person. Please forgive me, but you're part of the problem. <laughs> and it's true. 
It's, you know, because we're so wound up, we're so stressed, we're not taking care of ourselves and our pets are feeling that, you know, we're not grounding, we're not feeding ourselves properly. Like we're unhealthy mentally and physically, and that is affecting our pets. And so she brought up the idea of this like mirroring and modeling. And she said, talk to Karen about this. So I'm talking to you about it now. (laughs) Hey, excellent. So Okay, so let's just talk, let's talk about mirroring and modeling because if you were to look up this, the, the scientific or psychological definition of those, they're a little bit too narrow for what we're talking about. Okay. So I'm going to go from the perspective of how the animals are using those, how we're going to use those terms and apply them to how animals are operating okay. as opposed to the, the, the Psych 101 books and how they talk about it. Okay. Um, Just so mirroring and modeling, just before we even start, they come, they both of these behaviors, actions, types of reactions come from a really honest and authentic place with our animals, unlike in humans. Right. We, we humans have a certain layer to our soul, this intellectual part of our soul that can premeditate things in in a way that is manipulative right like at the core okay so that's that ego thing right so like nlp or in like going into an interaction trying to be intentional about i'm going to change my voice to match theirs i'm going to cross my arms if they have their arms crossed. like i'm you know that kind of thing very that's what you're talking about correct okay um, so animals, on the other hand, also mirror and model, but not from that perspective. So we just want to put that all aside. They aren't intentionally being jerks or in, or manipulating you by being love muffins. <laughs> that's, there's not, that stuff's not behind us. Okay. Um, so when we think about m- mirroring, for example, Mirroring is, in general, if you think about mirroring as as something that an animal may do, where they're using their own behaviors and emotions to show us how they are feeling our energy and how it may not be in harmony. Okay. Okay. So mirroring is usually one of those things that comes because they are experiencing something that's out of harmony or... um, they're getting caught up in energy and they don't know what to do with it. And so they start expressing how it's affecting them. That's mirroring. So when you think about it, it could literally be an imitating of what is going on for their humans or other animals, or it could be in a, just their way of trying to like express out the energy because they, they're having a hard time with it. So a perfect example of mirroring my sweet princess dia who if you follow me on instagram you've seen her everywhere she looks like a little egyptian princess um cat she has a very sensitive digestion mommy (laughs) human mommy here has a very sensitive digestion i used to have ulcers when i was a kid so the resonance of us having the similar kind of energetic patterns and structures is part of the soul's agreement to come in and, and to have sensitivities maybe to the same thing so that when something happens, I'll notice it in her, even if I won't notice it in myself. So for example, if I'm getting really stressed and my gut is getting clenched and my jaw is getting clenched and I'm not really thinking about how to keep myself centered and calm, she eats too quick and then throws up. So she's mirroring, right? The energy she's picking up from me that's really stressful and clamped down and and constricted and messing up my digestion. And she's showing it to me really quickly by eating too fast and then throwing up. So it's not the exact same, but she is mirroring the same thing. If I stop and think about it, if she's throwing up, my cue is, all right, what have I not been doing to ground myself? Like what's going on for me that she's in that stress energy with me, right? So that's a really good example of mirroring. Uh, you know, another example of mirroring just in general is if you have cats and dogs in your, or animals in your house and more than one, 
notice when they get agitated or into a scuffle, right? It, it may be that something's going on in your household where a few of you are disgruntled with each other as humans or people aren't listening to each other or um, someone is overpowering someone else. So they're mirroring that by them be showing how agitation works, right? And that the, this idea of either overpowering or getting angry and fighting with each other, they get caught up in that energy and that's their way of handling the over the overabundance of energy that's not in balance. Mm -hmm. Does that make okay. sense? It does make sense. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So that's the mirroring side of it. Now, the modeling side of it is really interesting because um, in this case with animals, modeling is usually more about their them using their own behaviors and emotions in a way that makes us stop and notice the difference between how they are and what's going on for us. Okay. And by that, I mean it in a really positive way. Most modeling brings us to arrests us in some way. It kind of makes us stop and sigh out of happiness or, or like, just be like, I really appreciate that part of you. Or I love when you do that. Wow. I can't believe I get to see that over and over again. Right. So modeling is kind of like they're modeling the aspirational behavior that we want for ourselves that maybe we're not giving ourselves enough of, right? So for example, um, a really good example of that, I'm going to go back to Dia. <laughs> so when she's modeling for me, well, what arrests me about her, right? What makes me stop and appreciate her is I will just, she goes into kind of this beautiful pose, drops her head and starts to meditate. And I can actually feel the vibration of it because I do energy work. And it blows my mind every time what I feel emitted off of her when she goes into that state. So that's a really good example of modeling. And when she's doing that, I and because it touches my heart so much, I think, okay, what's my opportunity in learning from her from this? Like, right, I meditate too. And that she keeps reminding me is a beautiful gift that I, I should be doing this more too. Mm. You see? I do. That is so interesting. And we don't, so many of us don't notice it. Right. Right. <laughs> don't um, certainly acknowledge it or really take it to heart, even if we do mm. notice it or acknowledge it. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 it's, it is very subtle, right? Like we, we have to be paying attention mm -hmm. to, we have to be looking for these things or at least know they exist, that they can be happening. They can be going on to be able to acknowledge mm -hmm. it and to be able to, I mean, I know, so like, I don't either. There are probably a million examples with my cats, but with my dog, she, oh my gosh, if, for example, my husband and I are not, if, if we're arguing over something or we're, which generally means we're not talking at all. Um, <laughs> she can, I mean, she, she can't handle it. Okay. She is needy and whiny and like, following one of us around on our heels at all times. And it, it's, it's for me, the saddest part of it, <laughs> much sadder than what, whatever else is going on. Um, but at the same time on a normal day, she's very, um, she's a very affectionate dog. And so, and she likes to be in between us. So she will try to like, maneuver us or if we're if we're sitting together and she can't get in between us she literally will just sit there and stare at us like you know I'm supposed to be right there in between you <laughs> until she can kind of get in between she will find like the tiniest little space and like wedge herself in and kind of tuck in and, and like that's just she's so uh, that's what I I try to um make myself very present in those moments, especially if she's touching me. 
I, I try to be very present and grateful and let her, like I'll pet her and let her know that like, I appreciate that she's mm-hmm. there and that she's doing that. And that's her choice to be touching me. Um, she's very, she's, she's very communicative. <laughs> so she's really modeling for you unconditional love, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Because no matter what she wants to be with you, she wants to support you. She wants to touch you. She wants to know everything. She wants to make sure everything's okay. Mm-hmm. Right. If things are out of, out of balance, her way of modeling, are you okay? Come back into balance. Let's talk. Like, yep. so all the things that she's doing are modeling, like really wanting to show unconditional love and support. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And that is her. That is her. Like, that's beautiful. She is very, she's a very sensitive soul. Yeah. Very much like me. Very sensitive. Right. So it's really interesting because I'm getting from her, actually, what is her name? Because I'm picking up some stuff from Kimberly. Her. Kimberly. Right. Kimberly. So when I ask Kimberly about this, she's modeling unconditional love when she's, when you guys are just chilling out and she wants to be a part of it and show you that she loves you both and that she's in harmony with the hangout. Mm-hmm. But when things are not in harmony, she's her anxiousness that's coming through is her actually mirroring and the neediness is Mm -hmm. mirroring the imbalance in not being heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Does that make sense? So that part of it is like, uh, I need you to, uh, somebody please listen to me. Somebody like you, you guys aren't listening to each other. There there's this neediness around listen to each other that's coming through. So that's actually, Mm -hmm. Um, a mirroring technique she's mirroring to show you yeah. that yeah that that's absolutely her yeah <laughs> very much high I know and it's it's also interesting to me I've had various animal I think actually my my first dog who I don't think you can see her she's the little chihuahua in the picture oh, right yeah now. I'm, I'm yes. too well she was a ch- Pomeranian and, and cho- anyway, she, um, she was, oh, how do I want to describe? Well, first of all, the absolute sweetest animal I've ever met in my life, oh. but she had such a curiosity of other animals. She would literally be in the backyard and like a snail or a beetle, whereas like the chihuahua that was not the chihuahua is like whatever like, like she just walks right over him pays no attention but my the pomeranian was like she had such an interest she would always stop and smell them and kind of watch them walk and wow. it, it's so interesting to me like they're different personalities and kind of that's kind of how i am too i'm very like i have to if there's a spider in the house first of all most of the time i i let it be like they're really great house guests but yes. um if I, if, if somebody else picks up on the fact that there is a spider in the house, I will catch it and take it outside. Or if a lizard gets in the house, I will catch it and take it out. So, so like, I'm very much a, um, I don't care what kind of animal it is. I, I want to take care of it. And that was my, my Claire, my Pomeranian. She was oh. like fascinated with other animals and just had this curiosity that I had never, I have still, I have never seen in another dog. It was really, really interesting. Um, That's so cool. I know, <laughs> but, uh, they do, you know, uh, they tell us so much about mm-hmm. ourselves if we just pay attention. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, you know, a really good one that I get from people all the time is, you know, it, people who, and I'm not a behaviorist. So this is going to, this is really interesting to ask you about because oh. I'll get people ask me like, can you tell my dog to stop jumping on people? For example. Like, well, no, I can't tell them to do anything. I can ask them what's happening for them, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. But I can't tell them to stop doing something because what if they're doing it because they feel like they have to? Yeah. So a lot of times, like, I, I'm curious from your perspective around this, but when I, and it's not the same exact story for every dog, for example, mm-hmm. but a lot of times when I ask a dog, what's happening for you that you're jumping up on people and a lot of times they're they're telling me about the that they're trying to fill in space Mm. so they're actually 
and that, that they're worried about protecting their person or they're worried about that, that nobody's doing anything, mm-hmm. right? So they're, they're mirroring the energy of having no boundaries. Yeah. And you would think it would come out differently, but from their perspective, having no boundaries and, and dealing with that energy means they're jumping up. They're, they're trying mm-hmm. to show the person there's no boundaries. So they're, yeah. they're kind of using the energy of there's no boundaries to mirror what happens for them. When there's no mm-hmm. boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really hard to explain to a person sometimes that it's about your energy not being there, which is why they have to fill it in. Yeah. It is interesting. And to kind of switch my thinking back over to <laughs> dog training. Yeah. Um, it is interesting because that is exactly what everybody starts off with. I want my dog to stop whatever, or I don't want my dog doing this anymore, or how do I get them to not do this? And my response is always, what do you want them to do instead? Because we, we, if we take something away, we're left with a void. We have to replace it with something. So it isn't about saying no. And this is the same with children. Mm -hmm. We can't just say no They have to understand why they have to understand what they should be doing instead. If we're not providing that information Mm -hmm. to them, they don't know what to be doing. Right. So they fill in the best they can with the energy they're feeling around them. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we can work with dogs to give them something to do instead Right. Which a lot of times is going to be a sit or a, you know, stay or wh- whatever that may be. But um, it it also has so much to do. And this is like the the training program that I have. It I don't claim that it's the best training program on the Internet. I don't claim to be the best dog trainer in the world. I don't think I am. But it is all about building a bond with your dog and creating that relationship with your dog and letting them know that you've got this. So like a dog thinks they, when you leave all of that space, when you're not answering the knock at the door, when somebody comes to the door, because we, we get Amazon packages every day to these days, right? When you don't go to the door, when something has occurred, In their mind, it is this open space. Like you said, it's a void. And it's like, if you're not filling it, I have to fill it. Right. And to them, right? And so we have to create this relationship with them that they understand that we we've got this. It is not your responsibility to take care of this. Right. And if we don't fill that in and let them know that that's all they know to do is to fill that space and take care of this is their home. Mm -hmm. You are their family. They just, I mean, through domestication, right. They just instinctively know to protect their home and their family. Right. And so we have to, we have to give them that framework of where they actually fit in the family and in the household and that it's not their responsibility. So we have to, we have to take up that space, like you were saying. <laughs> and take it up with the right energy. This is the yeah. interesting thing. Yes. This is where the where the mirroring thing comes in, is that if we are filling the space with our own anxiety, because mm-hmm. they have they have trained us to think that every time the doorbell rings, they're going to freak out. Yeah. Then every time the doorbell starts to ring, where is our energy? Our energy goes mm-hmm. into worry mode, right? So if yeah. we know that, and here's the thing, if we know that Amazon is coming in a few hours, if you check your energy, you're all, most people are already worried about what's going to happen in a few hours. So mm-hmm. their, their animal is already walking around in that sense of apprehension. Mm-hmm. And then the doorbell rings and we go into the, our version of fight or flight mode with the worry and the apprehension that we can't control. Yeah. our animal. And so we start, the human starts to think, wow, I'm, I'm not good at this, mm-hmm. right? I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm not, I'm not doing enough. I'm not, I'm not helping enough. And so what happens is the, the dog takes 
where the animal starts to pick up the apprehension yeah. and starts to go into this little, I've got to fill in the space and there's all this worry and, and, and worry is now tied to the door. And so they start modeling the apprehension of, I got to do more, right? Yeah. Which is really a mirror of, I'm not doing, I, as a human being, I don't think I do enough. Yeah. Right. So and it's really interesting how yes. deep it can actually go. It is. And that is probably one of the hardest things I think people, for, for most people, because I will tell them, like, you have to, in your mind, know, you have to know yeah. that they're going to sit and not right. bark. Right. Instead of that, oh my God, they're going to do it. They're going to, they're going to go crazy. They're going to embarrass me, blah, 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 blah. Right. You have to control in your mind and know right. they're going to sit over there on that mat right. and they are not going to bark and this is going to go beautifully. Right? right. And when it doesn't, that's okay because it takes time. Right. <laughs> but you just, you have to, you have to know that like, if you go into it knowing that I'm not going to be able to do this or my dog is not going to be able to do this, then right. you're not going to be able to do it and your dog's not going to be right. able to do it. That's, that's and you know how I always ask people when they do that. <laughs> I would say, so when you're in the presence of your, because they'll say my trainer, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. say, so I always ask, so when you're in the presence of your trainer, how is your dog? Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, she, well, she or he's great for my trainer. I'm like, what's, what's the difference? Yeah. What is your, what is the trainer modeling as an energy mm -hmm. that then that your dog is happy with? Right, because now the trainer is modeling an energy, so it goes both ways with the humans. And right, if you're modeling a really great energy, then the dog is like, "Oh, I like that." Yeah. Just like if our animal is the one modeling it, we go, "Oh, I like that." Yeah. So it's a really great. It's one of those aha moments, like, "Oh." <laughs> so, how do you talk to people or try to instruct people on being present, being aware? looking for these signs in their animals? So what I say to people is, if a behavior arrests you in some way, positive or negative, that's a sign something's going on there, either mirroring or modeling. Um, and that's usually where a soul, what I call a soul lesson, you have an opportunity for a soul growth lesson, right, moment. So... I just, I ask people to, well, first I ask the animal, like, what are the behaviors that you're using to help your person? Like, what are the behaviors that are arresting them or making them notice you or creating a thing between the two of you? And those, they will describe behaviors and the person is going, yeah, that is one. <laughs> and then I can get into it, ask the animal, so what are you trying to teach your person with this behavior? Mm -hmm. Right? What is it your person needs to know? What is it that you want them to understand about themselves while this behavior is going on? And that's, that's usually where we get into, is it a mirroring behavior or a modeling behavior? And what is the soul lesson tied to it? Because there's usually something tied to it about feeling loved or safe and supported, or if I, you're good enough or you're worthy and deserving or not, that's happening because trigger, being triggered because of these behaviors. or emotions or uh, health states even if if an animal's in a, an unhealthy mm -hmm. state or a really fit and healthy state even those things can be part of the soul lesson and tied to the mirroring and modeling so that's where I ask that's where I start and then I'll ask the animal what do you want now that your person understands what's going on here what is it that you want them to do with you in order to evolve and grow from what's happening. And that can be as simple as take a breath with me, take a breath, look me in the eyes and tell me we're safe. It can be as simple as stop this when we're walking, mm -hmm. right? Look, look at what I'm smelling in it and watch what I do. And then make a note of it in your head. It can be more complex. You know, it could be about um, the person's been giving away all the training and the fun stuff to the trainer. And that really what the animal wants is they want to play. They don't want to be like focused so hard. So, and that play is a lesson for the person. 
So it, mm-hmm. it depends on the animal and what they um, want the person to do with them in order to shift the energy. Gotcha. So when you say soul lesson, that makes me think of a soul existing in multiple lifetimes. Yes. So I'm wondering if, or do you feel like someone would have to believe in that to understand their animal? Or I don't think so, Not but I'm wondering how you, if you get those questions. I do. Okay. I, mean, I have to say most of the, right. We're in woo woo land when we're doing this work, yeah. right? as you, as you like to say. So if somebody's coming to me, most of the time, there's at least a little crack in there for me to get in there with the idea that we've existed more than just in this one iteration. But even if that's not something someone is completely open to, most people believe we have a soul, Mm -hmm. right? Even if they, even if you don't believe it, it goes on and on and on and reincarnates. Most people believe there's some part of us that is a spiritual, a soul. And so Mm -hmm. at that, from that perspective, everyone understands that the more they grow to understand themselves, the healthier and happier they're going to be. So Mm -hmm. I can kind of come at it from that perspective too, which is, you know, your soul's lessons around finding joy or having more faith in yourself or re- recognizing that you are doing enough. You are killing yourself for this, this animal. You don't have to go so crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the kinds of things that I can talk to somebody about and they, and they understand what the animal is trying to help them with. So, and I didn't prep you for this, so forgive me, but <laughs> it's okay. Do you do you think that if we do learn lessons, if our soul in this lifetime does learn certain lessons, that the next lifetime is maybe easier? I would say all I can say is if you believe we've been reincarnated from what I, what I've seen, heard and understood from animals and from people in spirit and from some of my spiritual teachers as well. um, We've been through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lifetimes. So every single shape and form of existence that you are seeing behaviors, you're seeing in others ways of being, you've also been Mm -hmm. good, bad, and different. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a if it's a like step by step incrementally mm-hmm. always getting better process yeah. or certain things get cleared and then there's another lesson to learn and so you got to go over here to learn it until you crawl out of that hole. I have no idea. Yeah. But I do know that we do have some free will and to kind of choose the more positive aspects, choose to do the work toward a, a lighter frequency, a, a healing, loving frequency does evolve our souls. And our pets are part of that. Mm -hmm. They help us and we help them. It goes both ways sometimes, all the time. I would say from the (laughs) animal's perspective, um, when we do something to, so for example, from pet rescue and, and some of the terrible things we see that happen to animals, when we choose to help a being, a sentient being like an animal who already operates from a place of mostly love, no hate Mm -hmm. anyway, our efforts to help them help us grow. Okay. That makes sense. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Are they learning their own lessons in their own journeys along the way, their own souls? I would, I would say yes, but they also are a lighter, more loving energy to start than we are Mm -hmm. they've already learned some things that we haven't so I I think they're kind of ahead of us when it comes to moving from a place of consistent unconditional love so Mm -hmm. they actually are our role models the ones that you know that choose to engage with us they are role models for us as opposed to us being role models for them I can agree with, I think I agree with that. Yeah. I think I agree with yeah. that totally. Mm. Um, 
so, but it, it, if I kind of bring it back to the beginning of, oh, my dog is now asking for my attention. Hey, baby. Um, in helping them, we're helping ourselves. Right. But in helping them, when we think about, because so many of us are, you know, we think about like the diet, the, the, you know, supplements, mm -hmm. the Medicaid, like we just so often neglect the spiritual aspect. Mm -hmm. And so that's why these conversations for me are so important because yeah. that spiritual aspect, a lot of times is the, the missing piece, like that yes. puzzle piece that we, we have completely overlooked and can really make such a huge difference in everything else that we're doing. Um, because it is part of a, a holistic approach to caring for our pets. Yes. And then when you think about it this way, the more present and more grounded we are as human beings, the more our emotions are in balance, the less energy we expend, mm -hmm. the longer and happier we live. Okay. And the less energy stress we put on our animals to try to find a way to help us balance all of that. And so the less energy they expend mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. And that, mm, I, I feel that so much. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, go ahead. So, I mean, it, which does not mean what I don't want people to think, oh my God, if I'm not perfect, I'm hurting my animal. Oh yeah, no. Right. No. Because that's not, that's not what I mean by that. It's just more, I mean, because animals are way more forgiving, mm -hmm. right? If, if we have a moment and they are in that moment with us and we see that it's, it's upset them when we come back down and we send them love again, they're good again. They don't carry mm -hmm. it like baggage like we do. Gotcha. So that's also, it's, th that's them modeling beautiful forgiveness. Yeah. You know? Mm hmm, mm -hmm. Well, Karen, I think that is a great way to end yeah. the episode today. Where can people find you on social media, on your website, um, if they want to book you for a private consultation um, for their animals? How can they get in touch with you? So there's a few ways. Um, the easiest way is you can just type in KarenDendysmith.com. That's my website. Um, from there on my website, you'll see the links to my Facebook my Instagram, the Animal Communication Collective YouTube, which we we didn't have a chance to talk about, but um, all of those places you can find me. And on Instagram, it's Karen Dendy Smith underscore intuitive. But there aren't really other Car Karen Dendy Smiths out there. So if you just type <laughs> in that name into any of the socials, you're going to find me. <laughs> awesome. So guys, please check her out. And if it, especially if you feel like you're doing everything, but something is missing. Yeah. I would highly recommend uh, booking a one-on-one -on -one session with Karen and just seeing what your animal has to say. Um, even if, even if it's something that you may have already thought, maybe you haven't acted on it and you just need that, that um, little, little boost or reminder that like, yeah, this actually is what your animal has been telling you. And so let's act on it. <laughs> right. uh, that can be really powerful and beneficial. And Karen, I just want to say thank you again for being here and for being such a kind, loving soul and um, for helping with, with my kitties recently. That was very, very special. So I can say with great confidence that I do recommend her and her services. And yeah, just thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me, Jessica. I love talking to you and I love talking to your kitties. And this was great. It was really fun today. Yeah, it was. Thanks so much.